So that was the end of our example. Let's just use regular colors today. It's making the computer go really slow last class. So when T is this, and that was, let's see, is this our normal definition of T? Yes. So when T is uh, <coughs> the usual uh, way it's defined, it's going to be a unit tangent vector. So we basically scaled it so it's always moving at one unit per whatever time unit you're in. Uh, that would be this T right here. Uh, we saw before that if your vector is always a unit, that has a special dot product with its derivative. So we saw that happen before. And what that means is, so when this is a unit tangent vector, then a T prime or D T D T, make sure that Tan unit tangent vector is capital. I'm just going to say T for either one, so you have to know which, uh, if it's capital or lowercase. So the derivative is always orthogonal to regular T. So we saw this property back quite a ways ago. Way into thirteen one. I proved it somewhere along the way. I can't find it now. Of constant length, here we go. So that was in three at the end of three point one. We proved this. So here we go. If you had a vector function of constant length, our length is one, but it works anytime you have constant length. We uh, took the derivative and applied the dot product rule, or you could just say the product rule and with respect to the product you took, and got that our dot product of these two vectors was zero, and we saw that uh, neither of them would be zero themselves, so that meant that they had to be orthogonal. And I drew a nice picture to show you if your vector lives on a circle of uh, radius c, then your derivative or your tangent is always going to be perpendicular or orthogonal to that point on the circle. So that's the visual representation of what I'm talking about right there. So that's why this statement is true. So if we have a unit tangent vector, then the derivative is always orthogonal. And we can move on. So basically, t, uh, the derivative represents how t changes. And I'm going to call this t prime. So it's how t changes. So if your path, I'll do a path in blue. So if you have some smooth path right here. You have a velocity. Uh, t is not quite the velocity. Remember, it's a normalized velocity. So it's always going to have length 1. So <coughs> you can also instead imagine a particle moving at constant speed. Not constant direction, but constant speed. So that uh, tangent vector or its velocity will always be a unit vector. So that's another way to think about this phenomenon. So what we just saw is that the derivative uh oh, what colors are we using? I think I already screwed up. Your velocity is blue. blue. Oh man. So that that should be blue. Something's gonna be red in the future. There we go. So here's our unit velocity right here. And acceleration is green or red? Green. Okay. Force is red. So your change in velocity is perpendicular. So we just saw that so these are going to be perpendicular right here so this is very useful so
So we have, we know the direction the particle's moving and the derivative or the, the way that's changing. And these are perpendicular. Uh, <clears throat> very likely the, uh, just because we have an orthogonal acceleration, it's very likely not unit. So if we're making a sharp turn, it's going to be really long. And if we're just making a super gentle turn, it's going to be really short. It's actually possible if it's zero, we're just going in a straight path. So it can even be zero. So don't assume that it is the same length. Depends on how steep the turn is you're making. So let's go ahead and normalize it, just like we did to the unit tangent vector. And we're going to call that n. So I'll use some green for n. So n is the uh, normalized acceleration. So I need a special, well, I can write down how to compute this pretty easy. It is not just t prime, but it's t prime over magnitude t prime. So right away, just from the definition, what do I need to worry about? So if t prime has a zero magnitude. So remember we said t has magnitude one that has uh, nothing necessarily to do with the derivative of t. All we know about the derivative is orthogonal, but you can have a zero vector that's orthogonal. Uh, so we're going to run into problems if our t prime is zero. So it won't work. when magnitude t prime is zero. And again, that's going to happen when uh, t is not changing. So when t experiences no change, that's when its derivative is zero. So we know t is always length one. So if t is constant, it'll be a constant vector of length one. What type of curve would have a velocity that's constant? It'll be a line. So you're basically saying the slope is this constant, always this constant, and that's a line. So this won't work for lines or straight line segments. So t is constant, which happens when curve is a line. It doesn't have to be an entire line, just some straight portion of the curve. So there can be no part of the curve that's straight if you're going to talk about the uh, normalized acceleration. All right, now that's out of the way. What's a good way to think about this acceleration? So I like to ride motorcycles. So if you're driving, riding on this road right here, you want to think of the acceleration, the normalized acceleration is the direction you're turning at that moment. So you're driving on the way to school through the ice on a motorcycle and you're going to be at this point in time, you just finished making a right turn, you're about to start making a left turn. So if you think about right here at this moment, you are starting to turn to the left, which is the direction that the uh, acceleration is pointing. So that's basically the direction you're turning into. So that's a good way to think about this acceleration. No normalized just says it's a direction and it doesn't care about how steep you're turning into that direction. So I have the same thing, even if I was approaching some crazy sharp turn, I would still see the same normalized acceleration. If I did normalize it, the magnitudes would be vastly different. A sharp turn has a huge acceleration, meaning if you're turning really sharply, you're going to experience a huge uh, acceleration. Or the vehicle will. You may fall out of it, but the vehicle will experience a huge acceleration. Whereas if you turn gentle, you'll experience a tiny acceleration that you may not notice. Question? What would happen if you have the acceleration uh, opposite the velocity? Uh, that's hitting the brakes really hard. So if it's directly opposite, uh, you will actually be going straight, but slowing down. Okay, so then that one is normal, uh, or I guess, or, 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 or
So we just said if you have a unit tangent vector, that means your speed is constant, so you can't hit the brakes. So in this situation... So the, the acceleration is zero? No. The magnitude of the velocity is constant. There's one, actually, in this. We're, we made it a uh, unit. Okay. So basically, you could think the speed limit is strictly enforced. It's always one mile an hour, or whatever, one meter per second. So every particle moving on this path has to move at that speed. So what that means, you can accelerate, but your acceleration cannot affect your speed. Cannot affect the magnitude of your velocity. So your acceleration has to occur sideways. It cannot have any forward component or backward component. Does that make sense? So your acceleration is always sideways if you're going at constant speed. It's a little. You can imagine this with your cruise control on. Basically, it's a little hard in real life because we have friction and your engine's always overcoming some air resistance and other friction forces. But if you were on some frictionless track, you would technically not need uh, another force here to experience acceleration. Wait, that's probably not true. No, because you have to be accelerated sideways by your track, even though you don't need like a mechanical force. <coughs> but just think, if you're going at constant speed, your acceleration is perpendicular to your direction of travel. Okay. Does that work? For a way of thinking about it? Yeah. I, I just kind of think that if it's if it's at a constant speed, it's not accelerating nor is it accelerating? It's, it's acceleration is not in the direction that it's traveling. It's not in the direction of your velocity. Okay. Normally when we say acceleration, we think of acceleration in the direction that we're moving. Because gotcha. so we're in a car, and acceleration that you control with the gas and the brake is the same, unless you're skidding out, it's the same direction you're traveling. Correct. So this is a turn acceleration, not from the engine. Your engine's just keeping you at a constant speed. Okay. So in this situation, your engine would not be providing acceleration. It would be just countering the friction on the ground and air. So your engine is canceling all the friction in this situation. So we're not really considering, because they're canceling out, we're only considering the steering acceleration. So there's a lot of other stuff going on that we're ignoring. That I'm sure if you go into engineering you'll probably have to worry about all that stuff. The other 28 forces <laughs> happening. There may not be 28, but anyways. <coughs> Alright, so that's N. Uh, N's going to point to the center of the curve. So, well, what's the center of the curve that we're on now? Uh, you could, uh, curvature is a good way to think about it. Curvature we saw was the reciprocal of the radius of the turn that you're on. We are not traveling in a circle overall, but at any point you could form a circle that would be the one that we're on at the moment. So our turn radius is not constant, so that means we're on a different circle at different points. So if you think about the circle we're on right here, let's see, I'll draw it in the light blue. Let's see if they'll let me draw a nice circle. Oh, that's decent. Wasn't the color I wanted though. I can move it over to where I want. Anyways, that circle is supposed to be intersecting at the point that we're on. So the idea is you can estimate your path at that moment with a circle. You're going to deviate from the circle unless you're actually doing a constant uh, turn, or if your acceleration is constantly uh, the same amount, you'd be making that uh, that turn on the circle. So that is how to think about turning. There's basically, at any moment, there's a circle that 
um, you're rotating in that radius. Okay, so that is how to think about N. Uh, we could write the uh, radius of the circle. So let's write that down. So radius is 1 over kappa that we computed before. Where you can write kappa as 1 over v times uh, t prime magnitude. Oh no. I turned my v in a fraction into a triangle. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we already computed that. Uh, if you really want to write the center out, uh, I'll draw it out for you here. So we have some curve. I'm trying to make it not constant uh, radius. So that was way too big to fit the circle on the screen. I'll take a point that's probably a slightly smaller radius. So we got our velocity right there. Our turning, uh, or our n is pointing to the middle. Now there is a circle here, and I'll do my best to approximate it. circle today. <laughs> Alright. Well, it's not exactly where I want it, but it's good enough. It'll work. So, we're approximating this turn by that circle. It's supposed to be right on top at the point, but I'll just make the point bigger and we'll pretend that it's the same point. <laughs> That's a very big dot. <laughs> All right, so this circle does have a center. Obviously, it does have a radius. Uh, the radius is one over kappa. And the center, I'm just gonna use C for the center right now. We'll write down what it is. Uh, we know the point that we're at. I'll write it as R of T naught. That'll be the position for uh, on the curve at some T naught time. So whatever T naught is, uh, that'll be the position we're at. And we can write out the center. And it's going to be R of T naught. What do I have to add? So what do I have to add to get to the center? Yep, actually I'll be part of it for sure. Uh, I'm going to draw the, the normal acceleration in green here. So that'll be N. I'm using N, I want uh, a normalized amount. So I don't want to use whatever uh, is a regular amount. This is the normalized amount. How do I find this vector? I'll draw it in, let's go rainbow. How do I find the rainbow vector here? What direction is this heading? It's the end direction. How long is it? R or 1 over K. So all we have to do is multiply N by 1 over K. That's why we took a normalized. I want the magnitude to be 1 over K. So we're going to take a unit vector, multiply it by the radius, which is 1 over K. And that's all we have to do to get the center. So we'll go plus 1 over K uh, times N of T naught. And always, all these are functions of the time value. So there's our center. Uh, this is a center at t naught. It's not a center for any point. It's only a center at the t naught value. And if I use a different t naught, I'm not very likely going to have a different center unless I'm making that constant curve. So there's our center. 
Uh, what we're going to do next is I'm going to give you a example problem of a curve and a point on the curve and I want you to figure out what's the circle, the radius, and the center. <coughs> so we're going to start y equals x cubed, easy function. Uh, we can graph that out. I'm going to do a really fast graph, the x value I want. Um, so given that, find circle find the circle at x equals 1. Alright, so we can graph this out pretty easily. It's a cubic function, so there are three easy points. 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1. And this curve cubic function looks like this. It's not the best graph, but it'll work for our purposes. It's kind of like a square graph, except it goes negative on the left. So the point we are concerned with is right here at 1. So I can get the xy coordinates, our 1, 1. I'm going to try to draw a circle, but given my luck drawing circles, it's probably going to be incredibly inaccurate. Uh, <coughs> first of all, we need to know what direction we're traveling, and that is blue. Uh, so, should our point be going uh, to the right or to the left? Let's go to the right, keep it positive. So, here is our velocity. It should be normalized. I think I drew one that was way too long. Let's try to draw length one. So there's t. Uh, we're going to need a, a parameterized with a time value. So I'm going to write t of t naught. I don't know t naught yet. Uh, n is a normalized orthogonal vector. So it's going to be perpendicular. I know we're turning to the left. It's a very slight turn to the left, but we're turning to the left at that point, not turning to the right. And so our normalized acceleration is this direction right here. That's n of t naught. So I know what direction the center should be in. The center is somewhere where that, uh, along that green uh, path where that arrow is. So somewhere here is the center. I can try to estimate it. It looks like our curvature is not that big. So maybe somewhere over here might be the center, I would say, but I don't want to just start guessing and then drawing some random circle. The only thing I can say for sure is the center is somewhere along that uh, dotted path. All right, why is this problem completely different than everything I told you in this entire chapter? We got a path. What's wrong with our path? So I gave it to you in rectangular coordinates with no time parameter. So, we're going to have to turn this into a parameterized curve. That's step one. We can parameterize it however we want. Uh, <coughs> and when I say however we want, it had, does have to trace this path out. Uh, but different choices of parameterizations are going to change what actual t value is at that point right there. So reasonable ones, I think, would give us a t equals 0 or t equals 1 right there. Those would be two reasonable choices. I think you've done parameterizations before, so I'll give you a minute to try to parameterize it, and then I'll show you the easy way to do it if you're stuck. So do your best to parameterize it. We're trying to find a uh, create an R of t. So we'll have an x of t and a y of t function, an x and a y component. So create this R of t. So do your best to create it. And I'll give you a hint. My easy choice is going to have t for x. So if x is t, you can figure out y very easily.
that. Any ideas for the y function? T cubed. All right, so that will work basically because if you know x, if I look at the original, if I knew what x was, I would know what y was immediately. So what I did is I just said uh, x is going to be t. So basically t just tracks how far horizontally we go. And then y is going to be t cubed. One problem is uh, horizontally my speed will be constant. My horizontal speed will be constant, but my vertical speed will definitely not be co constant. So in some sense, this may not be the best choice because uh, my speed's not constant. However, we're going to normalize our velocity. So the fact that my velocity is not constant is not a big deal. I could spend some serious time and figure out uh, what we did before, which is r of s inverse of t. That would give me a, uh, I can use my original r, figure out the s inverse function, and then parameterize it at unit speed. So that would be one solution, one way to get the normal uh, to be a unit. But this is a lot of work we don't have to do. So our choice right here is actually going to travel too fast. That's just fine. We're going to uh, compute t. So let's get started. Let me get to the right page in the notes. So t is see the easy t version v over magnitude v and of course v is r prime so we got r prime over magnitude r prime so compute these out right now it should be pretty easy to get The next thing we're going to need is n, so if you can find t, go ahead and figure out n as well. Make sure it's unit length. You can find the magnitude pretty quickly. Make sure it's unit length.
So any questions on R prime or magnitude R prime? So this is what you should have gotten for T. Now I did say you should check the magnitude. I'm just going to use some common sense. You should be able to tell right away the denominator is the magnitude of the numerator. That's where it came from. But just make sure when you're looking at it that you can see that it's a unit vector. So you should be able to tell by looking. Oh, geez. <laughs> yes. <coughs> All right. So that's T. Now, if I compute T prime from this, I basically have a quotient rule, but I didn't really show you the quotient rule. So I'm going to flip back in my notes here to all the derivative rules. Yeah, so there's, well, the, what I'm going to show you is two ways to simplify it to take the next derivative. So. I'm looking at the third derivative rule, which is a scalar function times a vector. And I'll write that out here. So this is the derivative of a scalar function multiplied by a vector function. So if we have, it's not a dot product, it's a regular product. And the derivative is f prime t uh, times v of t plus f t times v prime of t. So this is a product rule I'm going to be using. The problem is, I have quotient form, not a product form. So we're going to fix that by writing it as 1 plus 9t to the fourth to the negative 1 half power times the vector 1 plus 3t squared. Oh man. All right. You could distribute this inside, and then basically you'll have a quotient rule or a product rule on the inside parts. And it will give you the exact same result. I'm going to do uh, the derivative in this form because basically it's one less. Uh, you're going to pretty much have to do this product rule twice if you distribute it inside. So I'm going to do the product rule outside, so I'm going to do it once. And if I had three-dimensional vector, I'd have to do the product in each of the three dimensions. Good news is it's the same product part each time. So it should, if, if you do it inside, it should be, uh, it's the si it should be very similar. All right, so we got negative one half, one plus nine t to the fourth to the negative three halves power multiplied. Now I have a chain rule happening from this. So that's 36 t cubed. times, <coughs> so that was all the scalar function derivative times the original vector, plus, now my original scalar function, times the derivative of my vector, which is 0, 6t, all right. Uh oh. Let's see. So. Oh, absolutely. Quick question: What do you come up with the negative three half? Oh, it's one negative one half minus one. 
So I use the derivative rule that I wrote in the upper right corner there. So f prime v plus f v prime. So it's really a product rule. I did have to, there's a chain rule happening inside f prime. All right, so this is, that's just T prime. What do I need to do next? Take magnitude. Take the magnitude. So <coughs> what I did right here is really bad, and I see lots of students do it. What does it look like all these things I've computed actually are, the way I've labeled? So. I didn't write anything over here, so it looks like this should just be T and T again. Uh, you see that? I didn't write anything on the left, so it looks like they're all the same uh, expression on the right side. That's not what's happening, though. What is the first equation? Is that T or T prime? That's T. What about the second equation? T prime. That's a huge difference right there. Just because I didn't write things that led people to think so that these are all just T. So make sure when you actually take a derivative that somewhere on there is either a prime or a DDT. All right, so that's T prime, and now all we need to do is get the magnitude of this thing. That doesn't sound like much fun. Oh my goodness. All right, let's do something more fun. Let's figure out what is T naught. How do I figure out what t value our particle will be at that point right there? Yep, I did a very easy thing, which is set t equal to x. So if this point has x equal 1, well, that's also t. If I chose a different version for x, maybe I chose x was t minus 1, then I have to offset it a little bit. So. That point right there is 1, 1. That's, of course, the x, x of t, y of t right there, or really x of t naught, y of t naught. It's a little bit redundant to go through all this work, but basically x of t naught is 1, y of t naught, also 1, and those two functions, x of t naught was just the t naught function itself, y of t naught, uh, was t naught cubed. So either way, you see t naught equals 1. You could recover it from your x or your y. Things would be a little different if uh, we didn't have this. We got lucky because the x and the y function were 1 to 1. If uh, I chose a original parabola, I couldn't recover it from the y value. I would have gotten two solutions for t. So I'd have to be a little more clever. So if you're coordinate function is one-to-one, -one, you can get it from either function. If it's not one-to-one, -one, you may have to do a little more work and figure out which solution it is. All right, so we got our t naught value. Now, let's go back and look at this. Uh, <coughs> I need to find t prime's magnitude. Unfortunately, uh, what I'm looking at is the sum of two vectors. And so if you think about magnitude, Is there a nice magnitude for the sum of two vectors? Not really. So there is no shortcut for this magnitude right here. Uh, so there is. this is definitely not going to equal u1 plus magnitude u2. Uh, there is one case where it could. Uh, <coughs> this is called the triangle inequality. Generally, they're not equal. So these will hardly ever be equal unless uh, u1 and u2, anyways. I'll just say in general, they're not gonna be equal. So in general, it's gonna be less. So you can't just split the magnitude across the sum. What algebra can we do? We could factor out, but it's only gonna help us a little bit because the powers aren't the same, so I can't completely factor that term out. So I could factor out a little bit. Man, this is an ugly problem. So I 
hat. Oh, right there? Yeah, that's only a little helpful. Alright, let's just compute the magnitude. So all you have to do is, let's see, I think I have to collect all my X terms together and all my Y terms together. So I'm going to write one big ugly vector. Uh, let's, before we do that, let's combine things a little bit before I try to do everything at one time. So this is still T prime. Let's multiply. Uh, I'm going to multiply everything into these vectors. So we're going to have negative 18 T cubed divided by square root 1 plus 9 T to the fourth cubed comma three times this many so we're going to have t to the fifth divided by the same square root Yeah, I don't know what that is. Probably forty something, but it's probably maybe fifty something. I'm really bad with numbers. All right, is that right for the first vector? Seems right. I just distribute everything inside. All right, second vector. First coordinate zero. That was easy. Second coordinate six t over just that square root. And we can add these, that's the easy part. What's 18 times 3? 54? Okay, so there we go. That is T prime. Now we're ready to take the magnitude. <laughs> so I do a square all the terms, which will involve foiling the second one, and then add them together. No problem, no problem.